Bueno, y eso es fiwe. Sorry, even in an English church, I just, in Tanzania, I can't start preaching without saying that. Hey, I've got a question for you. Important question. Do you like dogs? N no, Trudy said no. I love dogs. We've got two dogs now, but when I was growing up, we had a dog. Now, Pokey is not a dog you would see around here because Pokey was a basset hound. And if any of you know, basset hounds are really good for nothing. They're big, they're fat, and they lay in one spot. If we play with her, she could last for one minute, and then she'd be like, ah, I'm done, I need a rest. So we thought, we can't interact with our dog very much. At least let's keep her where, where we are. So in the kitchen and the dining room, there was a, it, it was a tiled floor. So that's where Pokey lived. She lived with us in our kitchen. She didn't do anything. She laid there. But when we were doing our homework, she was there. Eating dinner, she was there. But there was a problem. Those two rooms were surrounded by other rooms that had very nice, very white carpet. And if you know, dogs and carpet don't always go well together. So we got this piece of plastic, call it a runner, but about this, this wide, and it went from the kitchen area to the back door because dogs, well, sometimes they have to go outside, if you know what I'm saying. So we provided a way for her to go outside. And so we explained to her, okay, this is, this is where you live, right? You, you live here in the kitchen, in the dining room, but when you need to go outside, you need to walk on the plastic. And we trained her. Dogs can be trained. And we trained her very well, and she would not go on the carpet. But very early, we learned that she interpreted our, the rule about the plastic a little differently than we interpreted that rule. So our thought was, this is your world, the kitchen here. When you need to go outside, you use the plastic. But for her, she saw the plastic as, as something that she needed to be tethered to. If she was touching the plastic, then all, everything was legal. So usually when we would come in, we would find her completely on the carpet with her leg or maybe just her toe. Her toe was on the plastic. And so we would say, no, no, Pokey, come on, come back to the kitchen. If you want to lay on the plastic, that's okay. But you can't lay on the carpet. And we'd move her into the kitchen, and she'd stay in the kitchen. And then we'd walk away. We'd go somewhere. When we came back, where would we find her? On the carpet. But again, just, just her toe is still on the plastic. So we had to sit down and reason, so we, reason with her. So we sat her down. Pokey, here's the thing. The reason we have the plastic is that we don't want you on the carpet. We need to keep your dirty paws, your dirty body off the carpet. That's why we have this rule. And she said, look, you trained me. You told me I need to use the plastic. I I'm using the plastic. We never got her to lose that. So her entire life, she, she stuck with that rule. As long as I'm on the plastic, I'm okay. And she, she never understood really what it was that we wanted. Now, eventually, we gave her away to our aunt who was sick because the dog was really good at just sitting there and doing nothing. And I love this dog. But this dog is a great picture to me of how I live my life sometimes. We had a rule, and there was a reason for this rule, and there was a good reason. But our dog was able to, to still follow the rule without having any change in her heart. And that's the problem with rules. We like rules, and I'm not saying rules are bad things. The Bible gives us some rules, right? What does the Bible say? Don't murder anybody, okay? It's a pretty good thing not to murder someone. Don't steal. Don't sleep with someone who's not your spouse, okay? The Bible tells us a number of things that are, that are good rules. I'm not saying rules are bad. But here's the problem. We can learn how to do just enough to follow the rule that we don't actually understand the reason for that rule. I, I remember as a kid, we would be eating whatever, we'd be eating somewhere in the house, and my mom was really clear, make sure you get your dishes to the kitchen. What did my mom mean? 
get your dishes in and wash your dishes or at least put them in the sink. But for me, as soon as I crossed that threshold, anywhere I found, boom, I would stick them down. We like rules because we can figure out how to obey the rule in a way that works for us. I just heard a story this week of a, a, a couple, a husband and wife in a church, and, and the rule in this church was you need to tithe 10% of your income. And generally, as they talked, they would talk about how, as you know, men, the head of the household, need to make sure you tithe. But for this couple, it was the wife who actually made more money. So what did the church think? Well, she should be tithing off of her money, right? But for her, she said, here's the rule in church. The rule is the husband tithes the 10%. Therefore, we don't need to tithe off my money. Now, the church didn't like that, of course, because here's a source of income that's, that's not being tapped, right? Okay, I'm not saying, again, giving is a bad thing. But she actually left the church, she left the church because she thought she was okay. The rule said the husband needs to tithe, therefore she doesn't need to tithe. And what happened? She completely missed the reason why we're supposed to give, the idea of it being a response to the way God has blessed us. Again, rules, there's a, there's a problem with rules. There's just a fundamental problem. Rules can't change our hearts. Rules don't change our heart. Because I can figure out a way to fulfill the rule, to fulfill the law, but nothing, nothing has changed inside of me. I don't know where you're at when you came in. I, Sheshi was, was feeling something this morning as he was, as he was praying with us and reading from Romans and said, I, I think some of us are tired. I think one of the reasons why we as believers get tired is we get tired of living the Christian life. All of the things that we're supposed to do as Christians, they become burdensome. Churches tell us different things. Some churches say, hey, well, if you want to be a Christian, these are the things you, do, you need to do. I've heard lots of things. Some churches have said, if you want to be a Christian, if you want to know you're saved, you need to come to the once-a-month overnight prayers. And if you don't, there's a problem. You need to be tithing. If you don't tithe at least 10%, you're outside of God's will. Right? We know there's a whole church group that says you must worship on Saturday and you must not eat these, these type of foods. If you break either one of those, you are outside of God's will. You are no longer a Christian. You're no longer a believer. We've got a word for this. We call this legalism. Legalism is what happens when we, when we make the law the most important thing, and we forget that there's something underneath the law. There's a reason why we have the law. Now, as believers, as we read God's Word, we know that there's a number of things that this tells us to do. Again, I'm, I want, I'm going to say this several times because I don't want you to miss me today, miss what I'm saying. I'm not saying that we're not supposed to live a certain way. We are. And as we get further in our series on Galatians, we're going to see that even more, okay? But the underlying message of the Bible is not that here are certain things we need to be do that we need to be doing in order to be justified or found righteous by God. The message of the Bible is, guess what? We are unable completely to do what we need to do. We cannot be good enough. But God says, I've given away through Jesus Christ. I've given away to solve this problem. Now, if you've been with us the last few weeks, you know that we're, we've been preaching through the book of Galatians. It's one of the first uh, letters or books that, uh, that Paul wrote. In the first two chapters, we just finished chapter two, in the first two chapters, Paul is talking about himself as an apostle, saying, hey, you can trust me. I brought God's message. Okay? And he's saying, you can trust this message. This really is the message of Jesus Christ. 
So he's been defending his message, this message of the gospel, and he's been defending himself. That's where we've been the last couple weeks. But now he's going to shift a little bit and, and dig much more deeply into what the gospel is. And again, as I mentioned before, some of us might be coming in here tired, and we're tired because it's, it's tough to live the Christian life. It's tough to keep doing all these things that we're supposed to be doing. It's, it's tough to meet up to the standards that people have told us. If you want to be right before God, you've got to be at least this good. And to be honest, when, when I, I didn't grow up in a Christian home. That was one of my questions growing up. How good is good enough? How good do I need to be? How good do I need to be to be right before God? That he would look at me and say, yes, you are welcome as my child. Yes, you are welcome into my kingdom. Yes, I have an eternity for you that will be with me. How, how good do I need to be? And, I've, and I struggled with that as a kid. Well, Paul speaks directly to this. So I don't know about you. I don't know if you've been asking those questions. But if you're tired of doing all the stuff you're supposed to be doing, if you're, if you're wondering, man, am I going to make it? Am I going to make it to where I, where I need to be, where I want to be? Paul speaks crystal clear here in chapter 3 about that. So if you want to open your Bibles to Galatians, we're going to be in chapter 3 today. today. Actually, just the first 14 verses. First 14 verses. And we're going to see very clearly very clearly that Paul is telling us that we're saved by grace through faith. Now, if you're hoping I'm going to bring you some great hidden truth, I, I got no great hidden truth. I just have the most basic and mind-blowing truth that the Bible gives us, that we are saved by grace. Read with me. I'm going to read through these verses really quickly, then we'll go back and look through them. Galatians chapter 3, verse 1. You foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Before your very eyes, Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed as crucified. I would like to learn just one thing from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by believing what you heard? Are you so foolish? After beginning by means of the Spirit, are you now trying to finish by means of the flesh? Have you experienced so much in vain, if it really was in vain, so again I ask, does God give you his spirit and work miracles among you by the works of the law or by your believing what you heard? So also Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. Understand then that those who have faith are children of Abraham. Scripture foresaw that God would justify the Gentiles by faith and announce the gospel in advance to Abraham. All nations will be blessed through you. So those who rely on faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. For all who rely on the works of the law are under a curse, as it is written. Cursed is everyone who does not continue to do everything written in the book of the law. Clearly, no one who relies on the law is justified before God, because the righteous will live by faith. The law is not based on faith. On the contrary, it says the person who does these things will live by them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hung on a pole. He redeemed us in order that the blessing given to Abraham might come to the Gentiles through Christ Jesus, so that by faith we might receive the promise of the Spirit. So when Paul wrote Galatians, obviously he was writing it for a reason. And there were these people who were teaching something. We call these people the Judaizers. The Judaizers. And what the Judaizers were saying was, if you want to become a follower of Jesus, you need to become Jewish. Okay? Now for us today, we look at, at Judaism and Christianity separate. Like we're two different religions. But at the beginning of the church, people who were following Jesus, they saw themselves as Jews. Okay? So, I'm a Jew, I follow the law, and now I've understood that Jesus is the Messiah, the Christ that we've been waiting for, and so I receive, I receive Jesus by faith. I'm still a Jew, but I'm a follower of Jesus. 
So now, when the church started to expand, and if you're interested in, about that, you just go ahead and read the book of Acts, okay? When the church started to expand, the message started going to Gentiles as well, people who were not Jewish. And so there was a question, well, how can someone who's not Jewish receive Jesus and be a follower of Jesus? So there was an argument. Some people said, well, in order to be a follower of Jesus, you need to become a Jew. And so these people, these Judaizers said, there are certain things in the law you need to do. The two main things, one of them you needed to file, follow certain dietary restrictions. The other one I know that Sheshi talked about in chapter 2 was the idea of circumcision. If you don't know what circumcision is, ask your friend, okay? But basically, basically this thing that every male child when they were eight days old, this, this ritual that they needed to go through, the Judaizers were saying now, Gentiles, if they want to receive Christ, they need to follow the same procedure. There are certain laws that you must do in order to follow Christ. And so that's what Paul is responding to here. That's what Paul is responding to. He realized that the people in Galatia were listening to these lies. How does Paul start this argument here in chapter 3? He says, you foolish Galatians. You foolish Galatians. Now, it sounds a bit strong. Um, it's, a bit, it's mixed. It's maybe not as strong as it sounds to us reading our English, okay? One translator translated it this way. Oh, you dear idiots of Galatia. <laughs> you dear idiots of Galatia. There's a certain love there. He loves these people, but at the same time, he realizes they're stupid. You're stupid. You are... How could you be so foolish? And then he says, who has bewitched you? Now, living in the U.S. for most of my not life, I never really thought of that phrase. But now that I live in Africa, and the idea of witch doctors and curses and these kinds of, who bewitched you? Okay. I don't think that's what Paul is saying here. I don't think Paul is saying someone went to the witch doctor. But the idea is that somebody almost, it's like they put a spell on you where you can no longer see the truth. There's a lie that you've been believing. And what does he say? Before your very eyes, Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed as crucified. Now, there may have been, have been some of the believers in the Galatian church that had, was there in the life of Jesus, but probably not. If so, very few. So how did they learn about Jesus? They were told it. Well, in Paul's words here, the idea of it was clearly portrayed, this is like the way we use a billboard, right? When you drive down the road and you see that bill, big billboard for, for Voda, for Coke, for Pepsi, whatever, you can't miss it, right? It's so big. That's what Paul is saying. The idea the, that Jesus was crucified, it was so, that information was so big, there's no way you missed that. You didn't miss it. You learned that Jesus Christ was crucified. So I just want to learn one thing from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by believing what you heard? What's Paul saying? Why did you get the Holy Spirit? Because believing that Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins? Or did you receive the Holy Spirit because you did the right things? You followed the Jewish law. Now, I need to clear, clear something up here. It says about receiving the Holy Spirit when you believed. You may have heard something about how we receive the Spirit later. Okay? Even this week, somebody told me, well, I believe Jesus. And then two weeks later, I received the Holy Spirit. Okay? Now, what was he talking about? He was talking about receiving the gift of tongues. Okay? There are times when God's Holy Spirit may manifest itself in different ways. He may empower us in different ways. Our spiritual gifts may come out at different times. But the Bible is clear. At the moment of salvation, you receive the Holy Spirit. So the same guy, though, I was sharing this, and he said, Oh, but then how do I know if someone's saved? Well, the Bible would say, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. 
Paul says that in Romans. John says in 1 John that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we confess our sins, he'll take them away. Jesus said in, in John chapter 5 that if you believe me, you will have eternal life and you have crossed over from death to life. Now much more than these cords I have to keep crossing over. You've actually become something completely different. You've crossed over from death to life. So how do we know that we're saved? Because we believe. We don't need to see. I'm not saying anything against some type of, of manifestation of the Holy Spirit, but what, what I'm saying is the Bible says if you believe, then you're saved. Then you have the Holy Spirit of God living inside of you. So that's what Paul's saying here. Look, how did you get the Holy Spirit? By following the law or by believing? Now for the, the Galatians, what would their answer have been? It would have been by believing because that's how they received. It would have been by believing. So I think in some ways as they're reading this letter, they'd say, yeah, Paul, it was by believing, right? And then he continues here in verse 3. Are you so foolish? He has to use that word again. Are you so foolish? After beginning by means of the Spirit, are you now trying to finish by means of the flesh? Okay, you've just admitted to yourselves that you received the Holy Spirit when you believed. You just admitted that you were saved by grace through faith. You received the Holy Spirit not because of what you did, but simply because God said, yes, I choose you. Yes, I'm saving you. Since you started that way, by trusting God and God alone, now are you trying to finish by the works of the law? Are you trying to, to, to make it to heaven because of what you do? Now, now this is something really difficult for us to understand, and I've struggled with it. I'm sure some of you are like me, you've struggled with it. This idea of salvation, how does salvation work? For most of us, the idea we receive Jesus Christ, and that's awesome, and that's wonderful. Woohoo! Now I'm a Christian. But then we ask the question okay, now as a Christian, what do I need to do to keep my salvation? Okay. It seems to me, and I've, okay, I haven't been in this country forever, I've been here about eight, nine years. It seems to me that the underlying feeling is that we are saved by grace, and that's a good thing. We're saved by grace, but then we're kept through our works. We stay in God's favor by living the right way. Now, I'm not saying we don't want to live the right way, but if we believe that God saved us because of our faith, but he will continue to keep us saved and take us to heaven because of how we live our lives, then we're just like the Galatians. We're just like these people that, that, that Paul has to speak against. What does he say? After beginning by means of the Spirit, are you now trying to finish by means of the flesh? It's pretty clear what he's saying, right? You started by faith. God is strong enough that, that he can keep you that you're going to end by faith. You started by faith, you can end by faith. If God's Spirit, if God's grace was good enough to get us in, to save us, his grace is good enough to take us to heaven. Right? So we've got this thing that we call justification and sanctification. I know these are big words. Justification is the idea that, that when God saved us, when he looked at us, he said, I declare you righteous. God says, I say that you don't have sin. Now let me pause. Do we have sin? Okay. I don't know a single one of us who has never sinned, right? I don't... If you think you've never sinned, ask the people around you, okay? Justification says at the moment of our salvation, in a moment... It's not a process. It's a one-time thing. At the moment of, of our salvation, God says, I, am, I choose you. I take you as my child. I give you my Holy Spirit. 
You are saved because I declare you righteous. I say that you are good and holy. And that righteousness, it doesn't come from us. It comes from Jesus Christ. Okay? We saw that in verse 1. We'll see it at the end as well. The idea that when God looks at me, and for those of us who have believed, when God looks at you, he doesn't see your sin. He sees Jesus Christ, perfect, sinless. That's justification. Okay? Sanctification now, this is a process. And sanctification is, okay, now that I've been saved, now that I have God's Spirit inside of me, how should I live my life? What is the proper response to a gracious, loving Savior? The proper response is to say, wow, I want to love you. I want to serve you. I want to be holy. I want to do those things the Bible tells me. And if I had to summarize what that is in four words, I would go Jesus. I'd say, love God, love people. Okay? Are we supposed to live good lives? I don't see many people nodding. Are we supposed to live good lives? Yeah, we are, okay? But the Bible tells us that our living, the way we live our life, it comes out of a response to God not to earn his favor. Not so that he'll love us more, but we do it because we love him and we're overwhelmed by the grace that he has shown us by saving us as his children. So that's what Paul's saying here. Okay, you started the right way. You started with faith. Why are you now trying to work out your salvation? It doesn't, it doesn't work that way. Verse 4, have you experienced so much in vain if it really was in vain? Your translation may say, have you suffered? Did you suffer that much? Okay? The word experience, it could mean suffering. It could also mean a good experience. Okay? But what he's saying is, when you became a believer, you received some persecution. Okay? Now, they would have been in their synagogues, the, the ones who are, are Jewish, Okay? The, the ones who were Gentiles, they would have been worshiping at their pagan temples. When you chose to follow Christ and your life started to change, you were persecuted. Now, Paul never tells us what that persecution is. Right? I've got a friend. Richard, we know this guy. He, he, he was a Muslim, and he's given his life to Jesus. And now his family... Basically, everybody but one person has rejected him completely. They would much rather have him die than live following Christ, okay? There's persecution that can come. Many, for many of us in our culture, it was very easy to become a believer. But here, there was some persecution. And Paul says, okay, you suffered because of that. Are you going to just throw that away now by walking away from this message? Is that what you want to do? Do you want to walk away from this truth that you heard? Verse 5, he says, so I ask again. Hey, if you didn't get this, I need to ask you again. Does God give you his spirit and work miracles among you by the works of the law or by your believing what you heard? He's saying the exact same thing again that he just said in verse 3. Why is God in your life? Why do you have the Holy Spirit? Because you believed or because you followed the law, because you did the things you were supposed to? And again, what's the answer? Because, because we believed. So what's Paul saying here in these, in these first five verses? He's saying, hey, you know the truth of the gospel. The gospel message is that Jesus Christ was crucified. He died. He was buried, raised from the dead, so that he could take the punishment for our sin. And if you believe, you will be saved. You will be justified. You will be declared righteous. I will say you are no longer going to be held responsible for your sin. You know that's the truth. So why are you walking away from it? Why are you allowing people to tell you things? You must do this if you want to be saved. That's not the message of the gospel. So then Paul in verse 6 says, I'm going to share an illustration with you that, that will help you understand. He goes to Abraham. He goes to Abraham and says, 
in verse 6. So also Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Understand then that those who have faith are children of Abraham. Now, all Jews would go back to Abraham and say, ah, he was the father of our faith. We look back to Abraham. Paul is quoting from Genesis chapter 15. He's quoting from Genesis chapter 15, okay? If you know the Bible, Genesis is the first book. This is really old, way back when. God said to Abraham that he was righteous because of his faith. It said that Abram believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness, okay? Now, these Judaizers, these people who were trying to add other laws, they were, say, they were saying something like, well, Moses gave us the law, and we need to follow the law. Hey, God told Abraham that he needed to circumcise, be circumcised and circumcise his sons. So clearly, we need to follow these laws. But Paul goes back to Genesis chapter 15 and saying, God said that Abraham was righteous because he believed. Now, that was Genesis 15. Circumcision came later in Abraham's life. We read that in the Bible in Genesis chapter 17. Okay? So he, God didn't say that you are made righteous, you're declared righteous because you got circumcised, because you did the rules. He said it's because you believed. Well, what about the law? Huh. The law came hundreds of years later. We see that first in the book of Exodus. That comes long after Abraham was, was dead and buried. So whether you look at circumcision or you look at the law, there's, there was no law back then for Abraham to follow. And that's what Paul's saying. Abraham, your father, your father didn't follow the law. So why do we now want to tell pe people that they need to follow the law? Okay? Now, it's an argument we don't have time for today. Why was the Old Testament law given? But just in summary, God gave the Old Testament law so that we would see that we need a Savior, so that we would see that we fall short, that we cannot live holy, pure, righteous lives. He gave us the law so it would point us ahead to something, and that something was Jesus, okay? If you have questions about that, I'd, man, I could talk about that all day. We can talk later, right? So he said here, Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Understand then that those who have faith are children of Abraham. Who has faith? Whoever has believed, whoever has trusted, whoever has said, okay, God, save me. Every single one of those people now is, is saved. Again, not by following the law, not by doing this, this, or this. Simply, our salvation comes because God is gracious. He saved us through faith. In verse 8, Scripture foresaw that God would justify the Gentiles by faith and announce the gospel in advance to Abraham. All nations will be blessed through you. Man, that, he's quoting from Genesis 12. Again, we're going way back. Okay? So those who rely on faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith, or or along with believing Abraham. That's what he's called in the Greek there, okay? So what's he saying? This wasn't something that just kind of happened that these Gentiles came in and started believing. It was God's plan from the beginning that all people would be saved. Every tribe, every tongue, every nation, everyone would have the opportunity, not just for God's special people, the Jews. So what does that mean for the, for the Galatians? Hey, anyone in your church, if they believe, they're saved. What does that mean for us? If we believe, we're saved. It's done. It's done. Those who rely on faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. We rely on, we trust that's the faith. We trust that God is big enough to save us. But, verse 10, for all who rely on the works of the law 
are under a curse, as it is written. Cursed is everyone who does not continue to do everything written in the book of the law. So he says we're supposed to trust God. But if we trust our works, that we can do something, that we can follow certain rules, guess what? We're cursed. That's what it says. It says we're cursed. Cursed is everyone who does not continue to do everything written in the book of the law. Well, wait a minute. What if I can do everything in the book of the law? Great. If you can follow the law perfectly, you will be declared righteous. So far, we've seen Jesus and... Nope, nope, that's it. None of us can do it. So Paul said, hey, if you want, you got a choice. If you want to go with the works of the law, go for it. But guess what? You're not going to make it. If you want to avoid the, confer- the curse, you must do everything. Everything written in the book of the law. Right? What does he say in, in, in verse 11? Clearly, no one who relies on the law is justified before God because the righteous will live by faith. You can't do it. You can't do it. If we want a relationship with God, it comes because of our faith, not because of how we live. Okay? Christ redeemed us, verse 13, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hung on a pole. He redeemed us in order that the blessing given to Abraham might come to the Gentiles through Christ Jesus so that by faith we might receive the promise of the Spirit. Again, we talked about this earlier, Jesus dying on the cross. How did this work? Jews knew from the Old Testament. God said anyone who dies on a cross, on a pole, on a piece of wood, is literally anyone who dies up there, they're cursed. They're unholy. Jesus took the punishment for our sin. When Jesus went on the cross, he did it because I am a sinner. And he wanted to take away my sin. Because you are a sinner. And he wanted to take away your sin. That is a pretty overwhelming message. That's the message here. That's the message of the whole book of Galatians. And honestly, the basic message of the whole Bible We are saved by grace through faith. It's a gift from God, a free gift. We can't work for it. We can't earn it. We can never be good enough. In fact, all of us are not good enough. We're saved by grace. What does this mean for us? If you have never said, God, I need you in my life because I am a sinner. I am not good enough, and I can't save myself. God, come and save me. If you've never done that, I believe today's the day. For most of us in here, we have trusted God, but even though we've trusted God, we've allowed that lie to come in that I need to do certain things. We've allowed those churches. Hopefully you don't hear those messages here at God's Tribe. But you've heard those messages in church. You've heard those messages from your friends that you need to do these things. And if you don't, you're out. Again, as we continue preaching through Galatians, we're going to see that we are supposed to live in certain ways. We're not supposed to be living. But that has to do with, again, our sanctification. How we live our lives as saved people. How we live our lives as God's children. Not, how do we make it to heaven? The transaction is done. According to the Bible, it's done. The moment you receive Jesus Christ, again, you became a new creation. You crossed from death to life. It's done. Friends, there's nothing that you can do to earn God's favor. There's nothing you can do to make God love you more. And another great message is that there's nothing that we can do that will make him love us less. He loves us. Why? I don't know. Simply he chose to. 
when we invite people to know Jesus, let's make sure we're inviting them to know Jesus and not inviting them to live a certain way. And one last thing I have to say, because this is so hard, and if I was creating the world, I wouldn't create it this way. But it sure doesn't seem fair. It doesn't seem fair that I might live 30 or 40 years doing the right stuff, and someone who becomes a believer and doesn't live a very good life and maybe dies after becoming a believer, how, how, how is it that they get saved just like me? That doesn't seem very fair, does it? I was going to go into judgment and rewards and all this stuff, but basically, if I think that's not fair, I don't understand the message of the gospel. Because the message of the gospel is that I am a sinner. I am unholy. I, in myself, have no chance, zero, no chance of being good enough for heaven. But God chose me. So if I look and I wonder, well, it's not really fair that that guy got saved and he's sinning. Well, well then I don't understand the fact that he saved me and I keep sinning. And I don't deserve salvation. If you came in with a burden because of the things you're trying to do, I want to free you from that today. And again, it's not me. It's and it's Paul, and it's not, well, it is Paul, but it's not Paul. It's God speaking through Paul. You are free from the job of earning God's favor. You can't do it. Let's trust him. Let's trust him that he saved us. And his ability to save is far greater than my ability to sin. Let's trust him. Let's trust him for our salvation and then we live our lives out of gratitude for this amazing gift that he's given us. What would happen? What would happen here as a church community if we really got that? If we really lived our lives fully in the confidence that we are saved. In the confidence that we know we have heaven. We know we have heaven. It's a done deal. And we can, we can live and we can love and we can, ser can serve out of that gratitude. What would happen in our church if we lived that way? Whew. Let's pray. God, you've given us a whole lot in just these 14 verses. But really, the message just comes down to that same thing that you communicate throughout the Bible, that you love us, that you are gracious, and that we are not able to be good enough as sinful people. We are not good enough to be in the presence of holy God. But you have chosen to declare us righteous. You have chosen to call us your children because you love us and because the punishment that we deserve was taken by Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord. And again, now I'm speaking to any of us here who've, who've never trusted Jesus Christ as our Savior, or maybe we're trusting in the things, the trusting in the things that we know, we think we should be doing these things in order to be saved. Can I pray for us now? God, thank you for the offer of salvation. Thank you for giving us your son. And God, we realize that we can never be good enough to earn your salvation. It's only by your grace and by faith today, Lord, we accept the gift of salvation. We say thank you. Help us to know the confidence that we have that you have saved us and it's done. And help us now to live lives focused on bringing you glory. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.